You want a war? You're gonna get one. Forget the lies, the money. We're in this together and through it all. They said that nothing's forever. Welcome back to Reliving the War and welcome to the first Monday Night Battle of 1998. It's the 5th of January, Raw comes from New Haven, Connecticut while Nitro takes place in the Georgia Dome in Atlanta. The new year begins with jam-packed episodes of Raw and Nitro, there's a lot to look at this week. I've done patting myself on the back in last week's episode so let's get stuck in and let's begin Reliving the War 1998. We see Stone Cold Steve Austin at the very beginning of Raw and Stone Cold heard that he's a marked man heading into the 1998 Royal Rumble. Every WWF superstar has a pager, according to Austin, and they should all take a look at their pager to see if they have a 316 message because Stone Cold plans on striking first. Austin says he's gonna do on the others before they do on to him, and tonight Steve Austin's gonna raise hell on Raw. Simple, straight to the point and no nonsense. Over on Nitro, oh, here we go. Over on Nitro, Tony Schiavone says the tape machines were rolling last week and the end of the Nitro main event match was recorded. However, WCW are not allowed to air the tape due to a court injunction. The commentators see this as a sign, the cracks are beginning to form within the New World Order, and it also didn't help that the NWO, for some reason, arrived to Nitro in separate limousines. Shivani confirms that Sting is still the world champion. He announces a Lex Luger vs Randy Savage main event for tonight. And then Mean Gene interviews JJ Dillon at the entranceway. JJ apologizes for Nitro getting cut off last week while saying the match turned into complete chaos. WCW guys and NWO guys hit the ring and all hell broke loose. Apparently, a judge has the videotape locked up in his chambers, I'm deadly serious. But an agreement has been made to release the tape within the next 24 hours. If you wanna see it, you gotta tune into WCW's new TV show airing later in the week, WCW Thunder, and you can also see a video replay of Nick Patrick's 3 count from Starcade. Hogan and Sting will also be at WCW Thunder and it sounds like some sort of decision's gonna get made regarding the world title, but as it stands right now at this moment, Sting is still world champion. I'll address this again here for you guys, I will not be covering Thunder on this series. It's just way too much work and I can't physically put another recap show together because there isn't enough hours in a day. I'm already way, way beyond my limits as it is, but anything remotely interesting from Thunder gets recapped on Nitro and vice versa because WCW struggles to fill so much TV time is very, very real. So don't worry, anything noteworthy that happens on Thunder will get mentioned on Reliving the War. The good Good news though, I covered the debut of Thunder in a previous video, so if you want the story and you want all the results, check that video out when you get done here. Alright, let's watch some wrestling matches, that would be nice wouldn't it? Chris Jericho vs DDP and Ken Shamrock vs Farouk. Farouk was kinda forced into this match by The Rock, but Farouk's a proud leader and he's not gonna back down. The Rock is nowhere to be seen though as the match gets underway. We are told on commentary that Don King will talk later on Raw, as Shamrock clotheslines Farouk over the top rope. Big Don King on Raw eh, can't wait. Shamrock brings Farouk back in with a suplex, but his crucifix pin attempt gets countered with a Samoan drop. Ken gets thrown out of the ring and Earl Hebner makes sure that Dilo and Kama don't interfere as Shamrock slowly gets back to his feet. Inside the ring, Ken Shamrock takes a clothesline before once again getting sent to the outside, and then The Rock shows up on the entranceway. We take a commercial break and when we come back, Farouk's performing a snap mare followed by a chin lock. The Rock's having a meeting with Kama and Dilo, clearly giving these two some sort of orders like he's the one calling the shots. It looks like Kama and Dilo don't want to go along with Rock's strategy, but they do it anyway, and of course, it backfires. Shamrock was supposed to run into a chair held by Kama, but Kenny Boy reverses it, and the match ends with a belly-to-belly -belly suplex followed by the ankle lock. 
Farouk argues with Kama as The Rock gets in the ring to fight Shamrock, but then Steve Austin shows up and both Shamrock and Rock take stunners. Austin's making good on his promise, he's taking out guys who are going to compete in the 1998 Royal Rumble, and Stone Cold leaves through the audience as The Rock and Shamrock wonder what the hell just happened. Last week on Nitro, Chris Jericho threw Dave Penzer off his chair, and Chris proceeded to wreck said chair by bashing it into the ring post over and over again. So Chris wants to make it up to the WCW ring announcer. Chris apologizes for losing his temper, he says that wasn't the real Chris Jericho that fans saw last week. The real Chris Jericho is a man idolized by fans all around the world, and Chris just reacted in the heat of the moment. Chris gives Penzer a brand new chair and a brand new tuxedo. Chris says he's sorry and it will never ever happen again. DDP makes his entrance and the match starts off with Chris going down after a swinging neckbreaker, but good guy Chris shakes DDP's hand afterwards. That's sportsmanship right there ladies and gents. Chris then performs a dropkick and we again get another handshake, but the sportsmanship ends when Chris pulls DDP by the hair and he slams him on the mat. Jericho says it was a mistake, he wants to make it up to Paige by offering another handshake, Jesus Christ. Paige says alright you little rat and he extends his hand, but Jericho traps the arm and DDP goes down. Big mistake. Once DDP gets to his feet, he delivers a diamond cutter and the US champ wins via pinfall. After the bout, Jericho complains again and he screams that he's had enough. Your good living Christian uncle Nick Lambros then gets interviewed by Mean Gene Okerlund. This chump right here is the WCW executive vice president and legal counsel. Ooh. After meeting up with Turner officials, there's a few changes that are going to happen on Monday Nitro. Because of the near riot that took place last week, you know, that one that we didn't see at home, WCW wrestlers are now subject to suspensions, fines, or both if they break WCW policies. Because WCW owns Nitro and because the NWO compete on a WCW owned television program, the New World Order can also be suspended or fined if they break any rules. Effectively, this should make the NWO a regular normal faction and it should give WCW leverage over the group, so keep this in mind going forward. Goldberg takes on Stevie Ray next on Nitro, while on Raw we've got Barry Windham vs Jeff Jarrett. Jim Cornette stands in the ring with Hart Brody and Dennis Coraluzzo, the respective vice president and president of the National Wrestling Alliance. Cornette says he flew these guys in at his own personal expense because Cornette wants to see traditional wrestling. The NWA was, at one time, the largest governing and sanctioning body for professional wrestling in the whole world. The NWA stands for tradition, and so these gentlemen have agreed to anoint the winner of the next match as the new NWA North American Heavyweight Champion. So, an NWA title match between between two WWF wrestlers on Raw's War. This kind of thing is cool, but the WWF in 1998 was a complete evolution of what wrestling once was, and this was a new and young fan base attending shows and watching on TV. I love the story of Cornette wanting traditional wrestling back, and I've enjoyed rewatching his commentary so far. I know the NWA and WWF was supposed to be a contrast between the old and new, but I don't think this worked too well. Still, I do like the overall idea of crossover like this, but I don't think it would have endeared fans enough to open up the history books and learn more about the NWA. Jeff Jarrett vs Barry Windham, they wrestle a normal regular match here, it's a WWF match through and through. Corluzo distracts the referee and Jim Cornette ends up smacking Windham across the back with his tennis racket. Double J wins the championship, so there's more to this than what meets the eye. There has to be a reason why these guys wanted Jarrett to win. It's all immediately flushed down the toilet though when Steve Austin shows up and he steals the show. Jeff Jarrett takes a stunner and Austin does his best Jackie Fargo strut before leaving the ring. So there, that's what the WWF really thinks about the NWA North American Champion. The strut was amazing though, not gonna lie. Jeff Jarrett's also gonna take part in the 1998 Royal Rumble, so Austin's just checking off names tonight and it's fantastic. On Nitro we've got Goldberg vs Stevie Ray, and this one's special because we see a Goldberg chin lock, or at least I think it's a chin lock, kinda like a weird camel clutch chin lock variant, where Billy Boy doesn't really lock onto anything, but Stevie Ray sells it like a champ anyway. Very cool seeing Goldberg perform a few power moves on a big guy like Stevie Ray, and I'm gonna take a wild guess here and say that you guys already know the outcome of this match. Goldberg hits the spear and the jackhammer, and Goldberg wins. Between this week and last week, Goldberg worked two house show matches against Bobby Eaton and Brad Armstrong, so our Goldberg streak counter now sits at 16-0 after tonight's matchup. 
Oh, fuck. Uh, Truth Commission versus Backer Michael Lackers on Raw. Brilliant. On Nitro, we've got John Nord versus The Barbarian. It's Ghost Recon and Sniper Elite versus 8 Ball and Skull. The Jackal joins in on commentary, and honestly, I don't even think Don Callis knew what his character was supposed to be. He's stuck in this incredibly boring rivalry where the in ring action is so mundane that anything he says just gets ignored. Maybe if he started converting other members from different gangs and he grew the commission into something totally different, then there could have been some. Something, I don't know. Anything's better than fucking recon sniper and big curry man. He can talk about a revolution all he wants. At the end of the day, it'd still be squared wrestling a dirty old asshole. Sniper takes a DDT and he gets pinned as Kurgan makes his way down to the ring. If Kurgan just walked a little faster, he could have saved the match, but no, who cares about the match, right? Skull and Eight Ball attack the big man, and the Truth Commission have a three on two advantage, and the bald assholes get wiped out. I've no idea where Chains is. Kurgan applies the claw, and Jackal has to bitch slap Kurgan in order to release the hold. Kurgan will be part of the Royal Rumble match, so if that doesn't make you buy a ticket, I don't know what will. On Nitro, John Nord comes to the ring. You may know Nord better as the Berserker in the WWF. Hush! Hush! Or, if you're a real virgin, you may know him as Nord the Barbarian from the AWA and World Class. What's that shirt say? Uh, if you don't like me, see back. There's something wrong with you. No mate, there's something wrong with you thinking that shirt was a good idea. You need to get over to chinlocks.com and get yourself a sick kicker be kicking shirt because I'm sure you're going to get a kicking from your opponent tonight who, ironically enough, is the Barbarian. The cameras catch Raven during Nord's entrance and even he's like, lol, look at the state of the berserker. Kidman's just confused over Nord's big fuzzy furry boots. Now, joking aside, Nord looks good here. The two competitors try to knock each other down and Barbarian ends up going out of the ring after a jumping shoulder tackle. Nord's plancha afterwards is… shit. And Barbarian gets a chance to strike Nord when the Berserker chases Jimmy Hart around. The two then fight on the entranceway for a bit, they whip each other into the guardrails. Inside the ring, Nord performs a Samoan drop and yeah, gotta say, you would not know this was the Berserker at all at first glance. The boots do give it away a little though, but again, he looks good. Jimmy Hart distracts Nord and this allows Barbarian to hit a clothesline and he sends Nord out of the ring after a big boot. Nord gets suplexed back inside the ropes, we see a pump handle slam from the Barbarian, but the old boot in the corner brings the Berserker back into the match. Both the Barbarian and Jimmy Hart get taken out with clotheslines, but the Barbarian manages to turn it around for a moment after dodging a corner attack. He tries to set Nord up for a superplex, but Nord counters and he pulls off a second rope elbow drop. Nord then applies a camel clutch while stretching Barbarian backwards, and hus hus motherfucker, John Nord wins the match. Hush. You know what, I actually want to see more of Nord in WCW just for shits and giggles, but this is his one and only match on Nitro. Mike Tanay says that another former WWF superstar, a former tag team champion, will compete later on on Nitro, so that's something to look forward to. Fun fact, John Nord never won a championship belt throughout his entire career, but he did win 17 DUI charges. D-Generation X cut a promo on Raw, while on Nitro we've got an Eric Bischoff promo. We've also got Psychosis vs Juventud Guerrera. Bischoff comes to the ring for an interview with Gene Okerlund and he says there are no issues at all within the NWO, so these commentators should stop spreading rumours. JJ Dillon got a chance to fix the Starcade debacle last week on Nitro and Dillon somehow managed to make things worse, and Eric said that Hulk Hogan defeated Sting last week and Hulk Hogan should be the champion. As for this tape that's sitting with a judge, that's all a big lie, WCW have the tape in their possession and they just want to hide it from the public. And you know, seeing as JJ said earlier that the video will get shown on Thunder, that just makes absolutely no sense. Finally, Bischoff says Nitro should belong to the NWO, saying his Zabisco got knocked out after a kick to the head at Starcade. Mean Gene says Bischoff used a foreign object and that kick to the head will also get replayed on Thunder later in the week. As a matter of fact, they near enough air the whole match on Thunder. The promo gets wrapped up with Eric saying the system is trying to stop the New World Order but that isn't gonna happen, and Eric then decides he's not gonna answer any more of Gene's questions. 
We have seen this next Nitro match before and you know what to expect here. I think besides Rey Mysterio, Hoovy is one of the biggest risk takers in WCW's cruiserweight division and this can sometimes lead to things going wrong. He does make mistakes sometimes but when he lands his high risk moves they always look spectacular. I think he was going for a really ambitious corkscrew head scissors here but it wasn't lined up just right. The thing is, you really can't call it out and you still have to give credit to anyone trying stuff like this on TV. A Little later into the match, Hoovy got drop kicked out of an aerial attack and this looked great, but Psychosis wasn't able to capitalize and Guerrero won the match with a 450 splash. With this victory, Hoovy gets a shot at Ultimo Dragon's cruiserweight title on WCW Thunder. On Raw, Triple H says China's chest is just like the sun, you know you shouldn't look at it but once you start you can't turn away. Immediately after he says this, the camera cuts away to this fan sign right here and look at the size of that nose. Hunter addresses Owen Hart while China keeps catching HBK looking at her bops. It's funny but it's also distracting because I didn't catch a word that Hunter said, something about Owen now being the hunted and Owen stepping up to the plate without a bat. Look, Hunter, mate, you came to the ring in a wheelchair, sit your ass down and fuck up cause you'll do nothing. Hunter invites Owen to come down to the ring but Owen cuts a promo from the Titantron instead. He says he wants to wait until Triple H's legs totally healed up so he can break the other leg. Owen's gonna do this because he has a black heart and black hearts feel no pain. Owen's badass speech doesn't come across so badass to Triple H. Hunter says yeah, Owen's a pain alright. But that's the end of the promo, Hunter tells Owen to watch his back and Sean doesn't say a word. We'll hear from the champion a little later on. Owen Hart's in action next against Salvio Vega, on Nitro Booker T defends the TV title against Prince Ikea. Booker gets interviewed before the match and Booker says he's on top of the world. He won the TV title for his son Brandon last week and while he gives Prince Ikea his dues as a former TV champ, tonight Booker's gonna turn it up to 100,000 Harlem Heat degrees. Mean Gene Okerlund can definitely dig that sucker. Booker thanks the fans for their support before making his way down to the ring and then Prince Ikea comes out to hopefully get his ass kicked. Booker gives a clean break at the beginning of the match but that little shit Ikea won't do the same. Booker takes a cheap shot back elbow and he gets floored with a shoulder block. Booker T then goes for a standing sidekick but it totally misses Prince Ikea and the prince still takes the bump. Thankfully the Harlem sidekick afterwards looks way way better. The prince takes an axe kick but he manages to dodge a second Harlem sidekick and Booker ends up on the outside. Ikea keeps the pressure on with a forearm from the top rope but back in the ring Booker counters a springboard attack with a power slam. Ikea goes down again after a spinning back kick, we see Booker's sidewalk slam and the Harlem hangover leads to Booker T successfully defending his title. Not the best match here at all but Booker T has a lot more to give in singles competition. As for Prince Ikea, yeah he was there. Over on Raw then, Owen Hart's in action once again, from former WWF Champion Shawn Michaels last week to Savio Vega this week, don't you just hate it when that happens. Owen starts it off with a big hip toss followed by a Luthez press and a few punches. The aggressive Blackheart then batters Savio in the corner, Vega takes a missile dropkick and then DX show up on the entranceway, this can't be good. Owen gets distracted and Savio takes the lead by sending Owen to the outside after a hook kick. Back inside the ring, Owen tries to steal it with a running cradle but Savio kicks out and Owen takes another kick, Sean feels it while watching from the entranceway. Vega once again sends Owen to the outside and Los Bariquas launch an attack but this isn't enough to stop the sole survivor. Back inside the ring, Savio thinks he's the giant and he won't go down after a few clotheslines but a wheel kick puts the big man down and Owen says that's it over. Owen applies the sharpshooter and Jim Ross says Owen's the master of this move. Hart's forced to break it up when Jesus jumps on the apron but it doesn't matter. Owen catches Savio with a roll up and Owen wins via pinfall. Hart goes after DX and he gets jumped by Los Bariquas. He gets absolutely destroyed here while John Michael says gracias amigo and Hunter slaps Owen around a bit. Hunter then pays Savio for a job well done and Los Bariquas ended up giving the money back to Sean for a quick rummage in his fanny pack. Are you a biker? Do you like people named Michael? Whatever you want to call them, biker, Michael, liker, whatever they are. Have you forgotten to wipe your ass for over a week? If so, head over to chinlocks.com and pick up the official Dirty Old Assholes t-shirt. Show everyone how much you love Michael and support Wrestling Bios. 
On Raw, Paul Bear cuts a promo while the Steiners and Ray Trailer take on Bagwell, Norton and Conan. Speaking of rummaging around in Sean's fanny pack, look at our main man PB. <laughs> Paul looks absolutely wrecked, defeated, tired and stressed out, and it's all because Kane and The Undertaker fought side by side last week. He looks like he lost all his money betting on horses the night before and he drank a litre bottle of Smirnoff to ease the pain. His wife then fucked him out of the house for being an absolute waster and he spent the day lying in a puddle of his own piss and depression. Paul says he hopes Shawn Michaels destroys The Undertaker at the Royal Rumble. Paul curses the ground the Taker walks on, he despises the air the Taker breathes. Paul hates Taker's guts. Bear says it's because of The Undertaker that Paul's lost Kane. The Undertaker's actions poisoned his little brother's mind, and now Kane has left Paul Bear. Bear says he's searched everywhere and he can't find the big red machine, so Paul sends out a message to Kane. Paul took care of Kane for all those years, so he really needs to listen to him. The message is simple. Paul says, please come home. We then go backstage and Stone Cold walks out of a locker room. It looks like Austin got to Mark Henry, another man who's gonna compete in the Royal Rumble. On Nitro, this six man tag was supposed to take place at Starcade, but Conan couldn't make it. Makes you wonder if the finish of this one was also originally intended for Starcade, but what happens here is pretty interesting and what's more, it eventually leads to something. Things get tense when Scott Steiner slaps the shit out of Conan before spitting on Buff Bagwell and slapping him across the face too. Remember how Six got in trouble for shouting obscenities on Nitro? Well, Steiner shouts fuck you at least three times, and I'm guessing Easy e wasn't rushing to reprimand the big bad booty daddy. Bagwell and Steiner have a pose down before Rick gets tagged in and Rick wants to flex a little just like Buff. The crowd loved this. Bagwell takes the scoop par slam followed by a few Steiner lines and then Norton and Trailer do a little work together. Eventually things break down as expected and the ring gets cleared out. Only Scott Steiner and Conan remain. Rick goes up for the Steiner Bulldog. Steiner lifts Conan on his shoulders but then Scott performs an electric chair drop instead and Rick's left standing on the top rope wondering what to do. Buff Bagwell Will pulls Rick down and Scott delivers the Steiner screwdriver to Conan. Scott then covers Conan and Scott wins the match for his team. You know why I like this? You couldn't tell at the time if it was a genuine mistake or if Scott was going into business for himself. Credit to the commentators too, they don't give anything away, they just talk about how dominant Scott Steiner was in this matchup. The Nitro Guards dance in the audience and look at this little guy right here. Go on my son, Alex Wright better watch out because that is what you call real competition. Speaking of Alex, where the hell is he? On Nitro we've got Rick Martel, yes Rick Martel versus Brad Armstrong. On Raw we've got Tom Brandy, yes Tom Brandy versus Mark Merrow. Someone in the crowd got it completely wrong and he thought Kevin Nash was on his way to the WWF after missing Starcade. Someone else thinks Bischoff and Hogan are love bros for life. A hype video airs for this Brandy vs Mero match because it's super super important. You know the story, Tom Brandy's been saving Sable from Mero because he has absolutely no ulterior motives at all and Mero can't have some slime ball interfering in his business. Mark hides behind Sable at the beginning of the match and Mero gets in a cheap shot. The crowd chants Sable as Mero knocks Brandy down after a few punches and Brandy gets choked on the bottom rope. The chants begin annoying Mark as Brandy takes a clothesline. Mero goes upstairs to put this fool away once and for all, but Mark gets his little wild thing smashed on the top rope and Mark ends up taking a diving bulldog. And pay attention to this edit job when Mark falls out of the ring and onto Sable. Yeah, they done that spot twice, no doubt about it. Sable's hurt her knee and Brandy wants to carry Sable to safety. Mark says nah mate and he delivers a double axe handle. And Sable gets set down super gently like the innocent little angel she truly is. Back in the ring, Brandy takes a TKO and Mero wants to send a message. So Brandy gets set up for one more finisher, but we don't see another TKO, instead we see a stone cold stunner. The match gets thrown out and Steve Austin gets a good look at Sable before walking away. It looks like Sable likes what she sees. On Nitro, these ladies are having a great time while this dude has cocks on his head. Rick Martel makes his entrance and he's looking pretty good too. And did you know that Rick was gonna join the WWF along with Don Callis in 1997 and come in as the Supermodels tag team? Yeah, a pay dispute led to Martel joining WCW instead, so it sounds like Vinnie Mac didn't want to pay up. This was confirmed by both Martel and Callis, by the way. I'm a big fan of Rick Martel and it's good to see him on Nitro for sure, but unfortunately, this 
run doesn't last too long. Rick counters a hammerlock by going up and over Armstrong, but Brad kicks out of the roll up. Armstrong then applies a side headlock, and Martel goes down after a shoulder block when the two get back to their feet. Brad applies a standing side headlock, and this gets countered with a back suplex, and the crowd are chanting boring. Clearly, this is a match they don't want to see. Armstrong runs into a knee, and Martel delivers a flying clothesline. Martel then performs a gut wrench suplex, and Armstrong hits the mat after a dropkick. Armstrong does fight back, and a side suplex keeps Martel at bay for a moment, but it isn't enough. Rick delivers a spine buster, he applies the Quebec Crab, and Brad Armstrong gives it up. The audience weren't into this at all, and you can sense some disappointment when Martel celebrates his victory. I don't think Rick did anything wrong, it was just the wrong time and the wrong place. Chris Benoit and Mongo take on Saturn and Riggs next on Nitro. On Raw we have Goldust vs Flash Funk. I'm surprised this Raw match is still on WWE Network by the way. Goldust comes to the ring with his face painted completely black and he's wearing an afro. Jerry Lawler says tonight Goldust is the artist formerly known as Shaft. Flash Funk takes exception to this and he beats the crap out of Goldust at the opening bell and Goldust takes a backdrop, a dropkick, a hip toss and a clothesline. He then decides it's time to leave but he performs the flare flop at the entranceway as Flash Funk continues to look pissed off. The action resumes with Luna causing a distraction and Goldust Goldust taking the lead very briefly. Flash Funk comes back with his jump kick that always looks very impressive, and Funk signals for the 450. Flash goes to the top rope, but Luna pushes him off right in front of the referee, so we have another DQ finish. After the bell, Goldust hits the curtain call, but then Vader makes an appearance and the bizarre one gets taken out. Goldust vs Vader's book for the Royal Rumble pay per view, by the way, and that match is gonna open up the show in two weeks' time. On Nitro, Horseman Business is back once again as old teammates Chris Benoit and Steve McMichael take on Parrot Riggs and Perry Saturn. Van Hammer, Smackhead Kidman and Raven watch from the audience, and Chris Benoit stares a hole through Raven. Benoit has now wrestled every member of the flock, and thankfully, the Raven vs Benoit match is going to happen very soon. Chris gets the better of Saturn at the opening bell, and he lets Mongo do a little damage while also taking care of Riggsy. Saturn takes a few shots from the former horseman as Steve gets tagged in, and Saturn takes a hip toss and a running power slam. Mongo then takes out both flock members while Benoit just stands and watches. But then Mongo gets suplexed after Riggs drop kicks him into Saturn. The timing was all over the place here. The flock then perform quick tags to keep Mongo away from his corner. We even see a double jumping shoulder tackle from Saturn and Riggs, and afterwards Mongo falls victim to a Scotty Riggs chin lock. But Mongo gets a chance to tag out after performing a double front suplex. Benoit comes in and he cleans house. Lodi distracts Mongo and Kidman distracts the referee. This gives Raven a chance to jump in the ring and give Chris Benoit a deep. DDT. Southern covers Benoit for the win, and that's it over. As mentioned, I'm all for this Raven and Benoit feud, but I really do wish there was a little more to it, and a bit more storyline. The good thing is though, their matches together aren't bad at all. Alright, alright, don't get your hopes up. Steve motherfucking Blackman is not at Raw tonight. The WWF just aired a hype video, and after this video aired, the production truck exploded into a million pieces. That's how intense this was. Steve motherfucking Blackman will take part in the 1998 Royal Rumble, and that means the other 29 jabronis fighting for a chance to headline WrestleMania now have a big motherfucking problem. Steve Austin is no longer the favourite to win the Royal Rumble match, it's Steve Blackman. On Nitro, Ric Flair cuts a promo, while on Raw we've got the Outlaws taking on the Headbangers. Jim Ross announces a Road Warriors vs New Age Outlaws tag team title match at the Royal Rumble as the match gets underway. The Outlaws do some double teamwork right at the opening bell, but they have to take a timeout when the Headbangers fight back. The match eventually resumes with Billy Gunn and Mosh in the ring. Billy misses a dropkick and he takes a great hip toss bump before getting his arm locked on the mat. Road Dog comes in and the Headbangers perform a double front suplex, and then the ever charismatic Godwins appear on the entranceway. Back inside the ring, Billy Gunn comes back in and he 
performs a big side suplex, Billy's on fire tonight it seems, Road Dog's back in now and Thrasher needs to tag out badly, when Mosh finally gets that hot tag, the Godwins decide to disappear, that's an easy payday right there. The headbangers then go for the stage dive but Thrasher completely misses his target and Billy Gunn scores the win for his team. A big miscalculation from the headbangers here and the finish did Mosh and Thrasher absolutely no favours. The outlaws beat down the headbangers after the bout and this leads to Cactus Jack and Chainsaw Charlie hitting the ring to make the save. The crowd made noise for Jack and Charlie but they couldn't have cared less about the actual tag team match. On Nitro, Ric Flair wishes Atlanta a happy new year before sending a message to Sting. Ric's proud of what Sting accomplished but there's a lot of guys now coming after that championship and one of those guys is a person who recently got under Ric Flair's skin a little, Bret Hart. Ric says he respects Bret's bloodline, his family, his heritage, Ric even gets a crate of Hitman Jam delivered to his house every month, but Ric wants to know why Bret's walking around saying he's the best when the nature boy's still hanging around. Bret's absolute dog shit WCW V1 theme plays in the arena, and his excellency graces WCW Nitro with his mere presence. Hart gets in the ring, he and Flair shake hands, and Rick says everyone wants to hear Brett say his little motto while looking at Flair in the face. Brett goes through his Rolodex of sayings, dirty stinking hyena, I don't think he's got the jam, excellence of execution. Brett comes to the conclusion that Rick wants to hear Brett say he's the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. Brett says he's thinking of adding a new line to his famous saying afterwards. I want to go, woo, at the end of it. Oh. Flair says that's pretty good. The Nature Boy knows Brett's a big deal in Canada, but this is Atlanta. It doesn't get more USA than Ric Flair. <laughs> yeah. So once again, Flair wants to hear Brett say his little motto. Brett's like, all right, and he says it again. And Brett wonders if Flair has a problem with the hitman claiming to be the best of all time. Flair mentions names like Harley Race, Jack Briscoe, and Dory Funk Jr. All men Brett claims to be better than. But Flair wants to know if Brett truly believes in his pink in black heart that he's really a better performer than nature boy Ric Flair. Flair says he wants the humour taken out of this, he wants to know if Brett really believes he's the best. Brett takes his jacket off and he says, to be the man you've got to beat the man and that's something Brett already accomplished. If Flair has an issue with Brett then Flair should just do something about it. Flair wraps it up by saying Brett's got a long way to go, it's a 5 time champion versus a 13 time champion and Brett's maybe going to have to beat the man again if he wants to call himself the best there is, the best there was and the best there ever will be. They ran long here and the promo had to get cut short but I thought this was great. I liked how they started off all buddy buddy and then they got serious towards the end of the promo. I just really hope WCW remembers that Brett issued a challenge to Hulk Hogan last week too and I hope that isn't forgotten about. We end our shows this week with a Lex Luger vs Randy Savage match on Nitro, on Raw we have Don King selling us on Tyson at Wrestlemania and a Shawn Michaels promo. Nick Patrick was supposed to be the referee for this Nitro main event but JJ Dillon comes out and he tells Nick he has to hit the bricks. He's under investigation after what happened when Nitro went off the air last week and until that tape gets released on Thunder, Nick Patrick is not allowed to officiate. As a matter of fact, he's suspended. Eric Bischoff comes out to complain and this implies that Nick Patrick maybe is part of the NWO once again but Dillon says the decision is final. Randy Anderson's gonna referee the Nitro main event. Luger comes out but he gets followed by Vicious and Delicious. Macho knocks Lex out of the ring and Buff and Norton attack Lex while Savage distracts Anderson. Luger gets choked on the top rope by Randy when the match gets underway and he goes down after a back elbow. We see more chokes from the Macho Man before he delivers a back suplex in the middle of the ring and every time he covers Luger the total package kicks out. Macho performs a gut wrench suplex and he lays in the punches immediately afterwards but Lex continues to kick out. A missed double axe handle gives Lex a chance to perform his comeback, we see the clothesline in the big power slam and when Luger signals for the wreck, Randy wisely rolls out of the ring. Macho then uses Liz to get the better of Lex on the outside and Luger gets dropped over the guardrail. Macho then manages to hit that double X handle and back in the ring Randy says it's all over. But Lex surprises Randy with an inside cradle and Luger wins via pinfall. A decisive victory in the Nitro main event, you don't see that too often. Savage complains about a fast count but Anderson's call was right down the middle. 
So Randy decides he's gonna take it out on Luger. Lex gets drilled into the ring post, Savage takes Dave Penzer's brand new chair and he also takes Dave Penzer. The ring announcer gets tossed to the floor at the entranceway, Randy lifts the chair high into the air but then Eric Bischoff runs down and he grabs the chair away. We can only assume Eric was paying attention to Nick Lambros earlier on, but Savage doesn't give a fuck and Eric gets taken out. Hollywood Hogan then runs down to try and calm things down, but big sexy Kevin Nash hits Randy from behind before walking away again. There really are some cracks forming in the NWO after all. Hulk tries to calm everyone down, Bagwell and Norton have made an appearance, and Hogan says the enemy is still standing in the ring, Lex Luger. So Macho agrees to go after Luger with his NWO comrades, but then Sting shows up. Sting stands in the ring beside his old friend and just as the NWO jump into the ring, the show fades to black. Cliffhangers like this I can deal with, cliffhangers during actual matches I can't. So I'm not mad about this Nitro ending at all and I thought it was actually pretty good. We go to Don King's house and he's got one of those 3D crystal photos you can buy in a mall for about 25 bucks. I thought this dude was a big shot. Basically Don says a big old load of nothing. He says the negotiations are still ongoing, they need to dot the I's and cross the T's. But Mike Tyson is very much scheduled to appear at Wrestlemania and Don says the crossover of Tyson and the WWF will create one of the biggest explosions in pay per view history. Don tells fans to stay tuned into WWF television because Don and Vince have an affordable pleasure at an affordable price and a pleasure you can't afford to miss. That's some top tier carny bullshit right there. Vince McMahon and Don King promise to bring these two giants of sports together and fans better get prepared. Don says he's excited and he says he'll see us all in March. The countdown to WrestleMania is now on. HBK gets in the ring and Sean says he thought he'd come out and call out The Undertaker seeing as Owen Hart didn't have the guts to come out earlier on. Sean says he has a casket match coming up with the Phenom at the Royal Rumble but Sean isn't afraid. Sean's beaten The Undertaker time and time again and at the Royal Rumble HBK's gonna prove that Taker is nothing but a loser. Sean's gonna leave the pay per view still the showstopper, still the icon, still the main event and most importantly still the WWF champion. HBK calls Taker Taker out, Michaels wants to smack Undertaker around a little in front of the whole world and then Taker's music plays in the arena. The druids bring the casket down once again and we can clearly see it's the DX casket. Sean laughs and he says he's begging for a little originality here, he thought Triple H in China could do better than this. HBK tells Hunter in China to get their asses out of the casket and he says the magic words, break it down. But the casket doesn't open. Hunter and China come out at the entranceway and they're waving at Sean and they're warning Sean. So if they're up there, that means the Undertaker's in the casket. Undertaker surprises Sean and HBK gets brought into the casket with the dead man. And Raw fades out while showing a black screen. JR says this is the view inside the casket. I'm giving this one to Nitro again, WCW wins episode 115. I enjoyed the quick yet effective DDP and Jericho match, Hoovy vs Psychosis was on point too, Scott Steiner's actions leave a lot of questions, the Flair and Bret Hart promo was good and the ending to Nitro also leaves us wondering what's going to happen next. Raw felt very safe this week compared to previous weeks. One could say the gold dust thing wasn't very safe at all, but generally speaking there wasn't much storyline advancements going on, with the exception of Paul Bear's promo. Everything else just stays the same really. It's another case of having two decent shows, but if I had to pick one, I'd say Nitro. Nitro now has 50 points on our leaderboard, Raw has 52, and we've had 13 ties. In the television ratings, Nitro won with a 4.3, Raw scored a 3.3. Next week we'll take a look at that tape that aired on Thunder and we'll get a pretty big update on the World Heavyweight title. Jim Neidhart arrives on Nitro next week, we've got the Outsiders in the main event and Goemon Jerry Flynn tries his luck against Bill Goldberg. <laughs> Good luck. On Raw, the WWF superstars get in the ring to draw their numbers for the Royal Rumble, the Rock and Roll Express show up for a tag team match, and Owen Hart infiltrates the Generation X's limousine. I'll see you all next week guys, thank you so so much for watching and take care.